stand here. I think we'll just put a lid on it, okay? Uh, let's see. I'll remind you that we have a second exam coming up, believe it or not, uh, a week from Friday. Uh, so I want you to be keeping that in your, um, on your horizon, as it were. Uh, the good news is we'll be done with that before Thanksgiving week. Uh, the bad news is we'll have it before Thanksgiving week. So it's sort of the same sort of thing. Okay. Uh, well, last time I made very good progress. Uh, I've only got one more thing I want to say about carbohydrates. And it relates, again, to carbohydrates on the surface of the cell. It's a very timely thing because right now uh, it's something that the whole campus is buzzing about. Um, and that has to do with viral receptors. There's one in particular, the flu virus, that uh, is out there that um, I think it's um, timely, as I said, and it's useful for us um, to, uh, to know. Flu viruses are complicated things. And they're complicated in the sense that they have multiple uh, nucleic acids. They're actually an RNA virus, so they have multiple RNA fragments that they have within their virion. And uh, when you hear about different flus for different years and so forth, H1N1 and all these various things, they're referring to different mixes of those possible um, RNAs that are there. And so that's how it's possible to get so many different flu viruses let alone you, you have all these individual fragments that can mix and match. You also have mutation that can happen, as, and uh, the combinations get very large in terms of numbers of possible flu viruses. Well, that's not what we're after here. We're actually interested in the carbohydrate uh, component of the flu virus, and it's a very relevant thing for what's happening right now. You see on the screen a depiction of the flu virus, um, and you see on the surface of this flu virus two very um, important proteins. Okay? One protein is called hemagglutinin, and hemagglutinin is a, uh, as its name suggests, heme, it binds to blood cells. Agglutinin is something that um, uh, agglutinates or attaches to. So hemagglutinin allows, uh, is a protein on the surface of the virus that allows it to attach itself to uh, red blood cells, among other things. Okay? Um, it attaches itself to specific carbohydrate structures that are on the surface of those red blood cells. Okay? Now, one of the things that's interesting about the flu virus is the attachment is not what makes the infection. The, the attachment, of course, is necessary for the infection. But after attachment happens, the RNAs of the virus have to be injected into the um, host cell. In order for that to happen, it turns out that one of the carbohydrates on the surface that the hemagglutinin has bound to, one of those carbohydrate residues has to be clipped. It has to be cleaved. Okay? The residue that has to be clipped is called neuraminic acid. And neuraminic acid is um, a, a modified carbohydrate. So the flu virus has an enzyme that does that clipping. The enzyme is called neuraminidase. You see it up on the uh, top of the screen there. Okay? So this virus is coated with alternating or various combinations of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase so that, for example, if this one attaches here, then this guy over here can reach over and can do that clip that's necessary. After that clip occurs, then the viral RNAs can be injected into the cell and infection has occurred. Okay? One of the strategies for stopping the infectious cycle of flu viruses is to inhibit the neuraminidase. If you inhibit the neuraminidase, you uh, prohibit that clipping of that neuraminic acid residue that has to happen to get the RNAs in. And so the flu virus just hangs around out there, but it's got nothing it can do because it can't inject its RNAs into the uh, target cell. All right. So when you hear about a drug called Tamiflu, Tamiflu is a neuraminidase inhibitor. That's what it does. It inhibits this enzyme and stops the injection of viral RNAs. There are other um, neuraminidase inhibitors that are out there besides Tamiflu. And some viruses get around this by having either altered neuraminidases or they don't even use that in part of their cycle. So H5N1, for example, Tamiflu is not very effective against. Okay? That's the bad one that kills about 40% of the people who get it. Okay? Uh, H1N1 is relatively susceptible to it. So if you have had H1N1, you may have been prescribed Tamiflu as uh, a way of uh, slowing the virus down and making you feel better. Okay, so that's the last of what I want to say about the carbohydrates. Um, we're going to turn our attention now, starting to think about processes. 
and processes in biochemistry are very important. You're going to hear a lot about them. And the processes that we're going to talk about um, uh, is the one I've been referring to throughout the term, and that's cellular signaling. I'll remind you that cellular signaling is uh, essential for a multicellular organism. Okay? It's essential. Here are uh, some examples of some signaling processes that we'll be talking about uh, to both today and on Wednesday. And signaling happens when um, uh, cells of the body release a molecule. That molecule travels through the body. It arrives at a target. It binds to a target cell and causes changes in that target cell. Okay? So at an organismal level, signaling is a very, very important thing. I'll give you one real quick example, and it relates actually to the first two of these right here. Your body um, has uh, varying needs for energy during the day. Okay? So if you uh, haven't eaten today, then what happens is your blood glucose levels start to fall. And if nothing else happens, your blood glucose levels would just go to zero. Well, of course, your uh, body has a sensing system that recognizes blood glucose levels are falling. We need to go back into reserves and start either making and or releasing glucose from places where we've got it stored. Okay? So that signaling process happens um, in one case with uh, epinephrine. So with epinephrine, for example, epinephrine is also known as adrenaline, but it has more innocuous functions as well. Epinephrine says, hey, we've got to have a bunch of glucose and we've got to have it quick. There's a grizzly bear chasing us. Okay? Muscles need glucose for energy. If I'm going to run fast, if I'm going to fight off this attack, if I'm going to do all this, I have to have glucose. So epinephrine gets released and it goes to the place where our body has stores of glucose and says, give me all you got. One of the places it goes is to the liver. The liver has wonderful stores of glycogen and wonderful abilities to make glucose so that it can put it out into the bloodstream so the muscle cells can soak it up and do its thing, do their things. Okay? So without that signaling process, you're eaten by the grizzly bear. On a day-to-day -day basis, without that signaling process, your brain would uh, basically uh, give out if you weren't constantly eating because you have to maintain a certain level of glucose. Well, your body takes care of that and you don't think about it. On the flip side, you may have a situation where um, you've perhaps been eating a little too much, or you've been even not eating too much, just eating a regular meal. What happens when that happens is your digestive system does what it's supposed to do. It starts dumping that glucose into the bloodstream, so the bloodstream has it to do things with. The liver says, well, hold on, I want some of that. We're going to store some of that away. Okay? The muscle says, well, I want some of that. We'll take some of that away. But meanwhile, you've had a Coca-Cola, You've had French fries, you've had your Big Mac, you've had this massive dose of glucose that you've dumped into the system. And one of the things you're going to hear me say over and over, it's going to surprise you, but one of the things you're going to hear me say over and over is glucose is a poison. I've never thought about it that way, but glucose is a poison. Okay? The higher your glucose levels are, the more problems you're going to have with it. Okay? Because... It really is poisonous, and I'll give you some examples about why in a second. All right? Your body doesn't want that glucose level to get too high, so it starts releasing another hormone called insulin. And insulin tells the cells of the body, take up this glucose. Because the blood glucose level is getting high, and if we don't do something about it, it's going to cause damage to our kidneys. It could cause blindness. It could cause damage to major organs because high glucose concentrations are problems for bodies. We say, well, taking up a poison, these cells are taking up a poison. Is that good? Yeah, it's good. Okay? Because they take up that poison and they convert it, in the case of the liver, into glycogen, which is not a poison. They store all that glucose in a form that's safe. So thanks to this signaling process that happens, okay, we release glucose when we get low, we take up glucose when we get high, and we don't even think about it. Okay? Now the problems when you hear about people who have diabetes and they have problems with managing insulin levels and blood glucose levels and so forth, the reason that they're doing that is because, again, glucose is a poison. If your insulin is not managing things properly, you're going to have problems. You probably know of people who have amputations as a result of 
di uh, severe forms of diabetes, especially in the elderly. Blindness. Okay. Further, the last thing I'll do to convince you that glucose is a poison, that sugars are poisons, is how many of you keep your jelly in the refrigerator? How many of you don't keep your jelly in the refrigerator? It doesn't go bad. Why? The reason they put so much sugar in jelly is because it kills microorganisms. Okay? Glucose, sucrose, these things are poisons. Okay? In high concentrations, they nail cells. So we've got to manage these things. And you're going to hear more about that from me as we get going along. Well, signaling is about managing many things. Of course, managing glucose is one of many. It's one that we're going to focus on um, quite a bit for the rest of this term. Other things that cells have to manage are decisions. Cells have to decide, hey, am I going to divide or am I not going to divide? If I'm a little kid, I need to do a lot of dividing my bone cells. I've got to divide my skin cells. I've got to coordinate all this so that my right arm grows at the same rate as my left arm does. Okay? So that I have some symmetry. So that I'm growing when I should be growing. And after a point, that growth is going to be stopped. And these are controlled in signaling pathways as well. So we're going to see how that uh, occurs. Signaling pathways, as you're going to see, are surprisingly complex. Surprisingly complex. All right. We think about, well, OK, we release epinephrine, and therefore we release glucose. And as you're going to see, this is one of the simpler pathways, and it goes through about seven or eight steps. Okay. There are pathways that have decision points of 30 or 40 steps. We're not going to talk about those in detail. Okay. But these decisions and these um, ways of going through are not unlike the kinds of pathways that we think about that information goes through on the internet. Okay? You type something on your computer, you Google something, okay? you don't think about how it left your computer, it went to the router, it went to a station, it went to a massive computer switching center, it went to Google, it came back. You didn't think about all those things. You typed it in, you got it back, you got the result. That's the way you're going to look at signaling. What we're going to do is see how some of that switching occurs in signaling, not unlike what happens in switching on the internet. Okay? So that's the overview of what we're going to be um, uh, thinking about over the next couple of days. Okay. I've said before that when we look at cells and what cells have to do, cells have pathways that they can turn on. And for every pathway that they can turn on, they want to also have the ability to have a switch to turn it off. Cells don't generally have a light switch. They turn on, they leave the lights running all the time. It's not good uh, energy usage. It's, it's not good um, a way for a cell to exist because the cell will burn itself out. So just as cells have signaling systems that turn on pathways, they also have to have response systems that turn off those pathways. A signal starts out for what we're going to be talking about as a hormone. Okay? We're not talking about nerve signaling here. It's a different kind of signaling that goes on. We'll talk about that next term, actually. All right? We're talking about hormonal signaling, release of a molecule. Hormonal signaling is done by molecules. They largely travel in the blood. And they largely ta travel to target tissues. That signal, which is the molecule, gets reception when it binds to a target receptor. That target receptor is typically a protein on the surface of a target cell. In the case of epinephrine, epinephrine can go out and target cells that will bind epinephrine include cells that have a lot of glycogen, for example. Muscle cells have targets for epinephrine. They have a protein in their uh, cell membrane that binds specifically to epinephrine. Liver cells have protein that specifically binds to epinephrine in their cell membranes. My eyeball doesn't have any uh, cells that have that target because my eyeball doesn't store glycogen. It doesn't need it. That makes sense because I don't want to be binding up all the epinephrine by a cell that's not going to use it when it really could be going to some cell to say, hey, look, we're in trouble. We need glucose. So we'll see that the reception depends on the cell type. And the reception is dependent upon proteins that are specific for specific molecules. After reception, something has to happen. And what we're, for all the types of signaling we'll be talking about in this class, the signaling molecule never gets it in, into the cell. 
It stays outside the cell. It binds to this, the protein in the cell membrane. It causes changes in the structure of the protein in the cell membrane. And those changes in the protein are somehow communicated inwards. And I'll, I'll show you how that happens uh, in a couple of cases. But the molecule never makes it in. There are some signaling systems, particularly uh, uh, steroid hormones, that can, in fact, cross the cell membrane and do things inside the cell. But the things we'll be talking about here do not do that. They all stay on the outside of the cell membrane. Amplification is important. Okay? We may have one molecule binding to a cell surface receptor, but that one molecule is an emergency signal. We need to have glucose. We want that full message of that one molecule directed at all of the activities of that liver cell to get as much glucose out as it can so that we can escape that grizzly bear. Okay? That phenomenon where that information is communicated inwards to the cell is called transduction. It's called signal transduction. And that just simply means that the signal is being communicated from outside to inside of the cell because it's inside the cell where the changes have to happen. Signal transduction. The result of that signaling, the result of that transduction of that signal is that the cell, of course, responds. If I'm a liver cell, my response is when I bind epinephrine is to start dumping out glucose in the bloodstream because the body needs it. If that signaling is binding of insulin to the cell surface, then the signal to the cell is start taking in glucose, exactly the opposite phenomenon. Okay? So the response is going to depend upon the signal, upon the receptor, and upon the, the transduction within, inside of the cell. Most of what you're going to see as signaling, you're going to think of as the transduction process. Because that's where the step by step by step by step occurs. Okay. It's pretty simple what happens up here. Okay, so that's a broad overview of what we're going to be talking about uh, over the next day or so. When we think about signaling, there's some terminology that comes up that you need to be aware of. The first terminology is that of messengers. Remember I said that the hormones that we'll be talking about here don't make it inside the cell. Those hormones are released by something. Maybe in your brain it says, hey, we're in trouble. Brain releases epinephrine so that the, you have glucose. That release of that first molecule, that first molecule is called the first messenger. The first messenger, just like the first horse in the Pony Express, is critical for the whole message getting across. If the first messenger isn't released, the liver never knows the body's in trouble. If that first pony in the Pony Express doesn't deliver its bag to the second one, there's no way it gets to the end of the trail. So we have to have that first messenger. The first messenger is generally a hormone. What are second messengers? Second messengers are molecules that are inside of cells that are made in response to the first messenger. I'll repeat that. So the second messenger is a molecule that's made inside of the cell in response to the first messenger. So we can essentially think of the first messenger as telling the cell what to do. We can think of the second messenger as starting to get the cell ready for what it needs to do. And we'll see how that occurs. Now, you're not going to have to memorize structures, so don't worry about that. These are, I'm sorry? No. Uh, these are uh, four separate second messengers, actually five if you count up here. Uh, four separate second messengers that I'll be talking about over the next couple of days. Okay? Cyclic AMP and its relative cyclic GMP. Very, very important second messengers. They're made as a result of binding of epinephrine to the cell surface receptor. Calcium. Calcium plays a very, very important role in signaling. We'll see that calcium plays a role almost as what I will describe later as a third messenger, though technically we call it a second messenger. IP3, a molecule found in membranes okay, that we will see breaks down into two molecules, one right here. 
and the other we'll talk about. I'm sorry, IP3, uh, back up on that. IP2 is made up of IP3 plus this molecule right here. It exists in the, in the cell surface. When IP2 is broken down, it yields these two molecules. Okay, and they each have functions. And we'll see how that goes as we get going further along. So second messengers are going to be very important for us to understand. Okay, well, let's uh, spend a little time looking at, first of all, the reception. I said that we have a messenger, that we have a first messenger that's released. Okay, and for um, the, per the, the first system I'll be talking about, we're going to be thinking about epinephrine. Epinephrine is the first messenger for this first system I'll be talking about. Epinephrine is a small molecule, as you saw on the last slide. It's actually derived from tyrosine. It can be released by various, por various um, uh, portions of the brain. And when it goes out into the bloodstream, as I said, it binds to specific cells that have specific receptors in them. And these receptors have uh, a name. The name they're called is 7TM. And you'll see why that's the case in a second. They're called 7TM receptors. There are a wide variety of 7TM receptors, and they can bind a wide variety of things. There are some 7TM receptors that bind epinephrine. There are some 7TM receptors that bind other things. And so 7TM receptors are a class of membrane receptors. When we look at the functions that they can help control, it's extensive. Okay? They can control how hormones turn on and turn off functions in cells. They can control how hormones are secreted. They can control neurotransmission, chemotaxis, the response to chemicals, exocytosis, the movement of things outside of cells, the control of blood pressure, embryogenesis, cell growth, development, smell, taste, vision, viral infection. Okay, that's a pretty significant list of things that 7TMs are involved in. Many, many 7TMs. 7TMs get their name by virtue of the fact that they are, first of all, transmembrane proteins, meaning that they span across the membrane. That's the TM part. The 7 part comes from the fact that if you look at the, the schematic structure of a 7TM in a membrane, it looks like this. We have one end, cross, 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 cross. We see it crosses the membrane seven times. All of these 7TM receptors have that common structure. Now, this is a very simple cartoon. It's shown as a flat two-dimensional um, uh, protein. Okay? It's not really two-dimensional. In fact, a better way of looking at it is more like this. And you'll see it has a sort of a, almost a barrel-like shape. We have a portion, because they stick through the membrane, Part of the 7TM sticks outside of the cell, faces outside the cell, and part of the 7TM faces inside of the cell. And it's because of this that the 7TM can recognize signals on the outside, binding of a hormone, an epinephrine, for example, and cause changes to happen inside only when that signal is received. We'll talk about that. Now, there's epinephrine. Again, you don't need to know the structure, but you can see that it is, in fact, related to tyrosine. There's the amine component. There's the benzene ring that you've seen associated with tyrosine before. What I'm going to do now is show you the very first pathway uh, of signaling. And I'm going to explain to you in hopefully not too excruciating detail how it works, but there are some things that you need to know about it. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a target cell. That target cell could be a liver cell, it could be a muscle cell, based on what I've told you so far. They both have seven TMs that recognize epinephrine. Okay? The body releases epinephrine, and it flows through the bloodstream until it bumps into something that it sticks to. And one of the things that it can stick to, of course, is a seven TM. We've been talking all term about how binding of small molecules to proteins can have slight structural changes that they induce in those proteins. And a 7TM is no different than any other one that we've talked about. There is, in fact, a very slight change in the structure of the 7TM that is realized upon binding of its 
a target, in this case, epinephrine. That slight change that exists as a result of binding here is communicated inwards. It's communicated inwards. Now, this is the part that's a little hard to understand, but it's not complicated. The change in on the inside for this 7TM causes it to do something to an interesting protein called a G protein. Okay. A G protein gets its name from the fact that it binds guanine nucleotides. Notice we haven't gotten to cyclic AMP yet. We're going to get to that. Okay. We haven't gotten to that yet. So we bound the hormone. The 7TM changed shape. That changed shape caused the, uh, an interaction to change with the G protein. That interaction that changed causes the following to happen. It causes the G protein to let go of GDP, which it previously was bound to, and replace it with GTP. Now notice, it did not convert GDP to GDP, I, GTP. I said it caused it to be released and replaced, and that's what happens. So GDP is released from the G protein, and GTP is bound by it. The binding of GTP by the G protein, you notice the G protein has three subunits. They're called alpha in purple, beta in blue, and gamma in yellow. You'll notice that there is an interaction between the blue and the purple when it is bound to GDP. The binding by the alpha subunit of GTP causes it to change shape slightly, and guess what? It no longer associates with the beta and gamma subunits. They go flying off, and now the alpha subunit is free all by itself, binding GTP, to go interact with another membrane protein. The other membrane protein is an enzyme. Okay? So if we have this situation sitting over here with the GDP, it won't interact with adenylate cyclase. But when that beta and gamma subunits are removed, there is a site on here that now is exposed that can bind to the adenylate cyclase. So only when the alpha subunit has GTP can, in fact, the G protein interact with adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is an enzyme, as I said, and it's, as its name suggests, cyclase making a, a circle. Adenylate cyclase catalyzes the formation of cyclic AMP. There is our second messenger. Okay. So this step by step by step has now resulted in production in the cell of cyclic AMP. Okay? Cyclic AMP has some very drastic effects inside of cells, and I'm going to tell you about some of them. Okay? One of them you've already seen, and that is that when we talked about protein kinase A, and we talked about the fact that protein kinase A had an interesting allosteric control, it had two regulatory subunits. It had two catalytic subunits. And I said when the two regulatory subunits bound to cyclic AMP, what happened? They let go of the catalytics. The catalytics go out and they start catalyzing things. And what they catalyze is the phosphorylation of proteins. Now we see that the binding of the hormone on the outside has now started to change the phosphorylation state of a whole bunch of proteins. You're going to see more of these later in the term. But I want you to imagine that now we're stimulating a lot of phosphorylation that's happening inside of these cells. That's exactly what's going on. And if we think about how phosphorylation of enzymes may turn some enzymes off and it may turn other enzymes on, we can see that we could really change what a cell is doing as a result of binding of a single epinephrine to a cell surface receptor. Okay? Clear so far? Yes, Kyle? GTP to is it bound here? Is it bound here? 
So the interaction between this subunit, which is the purple, and this guy is such that it causes a structural change in the adenylate cyclase so that it now becomes active and starts making cyclic AMP. Does that answer your question? Okay. It's not the GTP. It's the interaction between the protein with the GTP and the adenylate cyclase that causes adenylate cyclase to become active. Yes? Yeah, they're just trying to show you somehow that it's active in some way. Now, so we can think of what we've just done is we've activated a G protein. We've turned that G protein on. Right? That's cool. We've turned on this G protein. We've turned on a phosphorylation cascade. And I'll tell you briefly now what that phosphorylation cascade does. One of the things that it does is it stimulates enzymes that break down glycogen. It stimulates enzymes that break down glycogen. So the net product of this is that this is a liver cell. This liver cell is going to start breaking down its glycogen. And when you break down glycogen, you ultimately get glucose. There's a two-step process, but that's all it takes. Two steps to get to glucose. OK? Bang, we've made a lot of glucose. Now, when I said when I first started talking about signaling, I said that when we, have, when we turn a switch on, we also want to be able to turn a switch off. If we don't turn that switch off, we're going to be in trouble. Right? Because what's going to happen, we're going to turn the switch on, we're going to make this protein kinase A active, it's going to activate all of our enzymes for breaking down glycogen, we're going to break down all of our glycogen, and we're not going to have any glycogen left. When we've escaped the grizzly bear, we don't want to continue breaking down glycogen, it's time to stop doing that and save what we've got so we don't just go through everything away. So we want to be able to turn this system off in addition to be able, being able to turn it on. That's the flip side of it. How do we turn this system off? Okay. Well, we're going to see there's actually three ways it can occur. I'm going to tell you about two of them right now. One way it occurs is going to surprise you. Okay. G proteins are signaling molecules. They're also very bad enzymes. They're very bad enzymes. Okay. What's the significance of that? Well, I'll give you the significance of that. The very bad enzyme, the alpha subunit of the G protein, its activity is it breaks down GTP to GDP. Now, if it's a very good enzyme, as soon as it gets GTP, what's it going to do? It's going to break it down, there's not going to be a signal communicated, and we're not going to have anything going on. It's a bad enzyme that it might take seconds or minutes for it to break that GTP down into GDP. And in that meantime, when it's bound to GTP, it has a chance to activate adenylate cyclase. That means that this G protein, if everything is working properly, won't stay turned on all the time. Makes sense? It has a self controlling system. It has a way of turning itself off. When it turns itself off, it cleaves itself, its GTP to GDP. It can no longer bind here. It goes back and picks up the subunits that it lost and goes back here and waits for the next thing to happen. The fact that it is a poor enzyme allows that to happen. That's, the more efficient that enzyme is, the more in trouble you are. Now, that's one way of turning off the signal. But there's other problems. Another problem is, what about this cyclic AMP that I made? Uh-oh. That cyclic AMP is just going to sit there, if nothing else happens, and it's going, I can stop making cyclic AMP, but there's going to be enough here to keep glycogen breakdown going on all the time anyway. I don't want that either. Well, it turns out that cyclic AMP has an en is attacked by an enzyme that's fairly abundant inside of cells has a general name known as phosphodiesterase. P-H-O-S-P-H-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-R-A-S-E. Phosphodiesterase cleaves cyclic AMP and yields AMP, which has no effect like cyclic AMP does. So normally, during the normal scheme of things, this guy is active for a short period of time. 
A bunch of this gets made, but phosphodiesterase starts catching up and starts breaking it down, and the signal sort of dies out. How do we make that signal go on longer? How many people went to the beanery this morning? There's one right there. Okay, Caffeine. Caffeine inhibits phosphodiesterase. Now, when caffeine inhibits phosphodiesterase, you tell me what's going to happen with this signal. Cyclic AMP is going to be around for a longer period of time. More glycogen is going to get broken down. More glucose is going to get released. And that buzz you say, I get from caffeine, is from that increase in blood sugar that you just got from your cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. Make sense? Yes? Is that why I get hungry all the time when I drink coffee? Is that why I get hungry all the time when I drink coffee? You betcha. Because what happens is once your blood glucose levels goes up, if it goes up too much, then what happens is you start stimulating insulin, which now causes blood glucose levels to fall, and it's on the fall side where you get hungry. You don't get hungry immediately, but you probably get hungry within about half an hour to an hour afterwards, I would guess. Yeah. Right? Bingo. Okay? Other questions? There's mud. Everybody knows why ca caffeine is, is... And actually, caffeine's pretty good for you. What, one of the things that we're finding in recent years is that even reasonably heavy coffee drinking is pretty protective for the liver. The liver does pretty well with caffeine. I'm not saying you should go out and do 20 cups a day, <laughs> but, you know, if you, uh, I've, I've heard as many as six cups a day is actually pretty good for your liver, and there is why? a protective effect on the liver. I'm sorry? Why? It's not completely known why that's the case, but from what I'm telling you, um, I hope that you would see how the, the liver is probably dealing more with, with glucose levels um, uh, in, in a proper fashion. But I, I can tell you more about that separately. Yes, question back in the back. Say it again. Yes. So the question is, you have to reset the pathway. You have to rebind the beta and gamma subunits. And that's exactly right. So when this guy, when the alpha subunit cleaves GTP to make GDP, it no longer stays bound to here, and now it does rebind those beta and gamma subunits. Am I answering your question? Hand, yes, question. I, I can't hear, I'm sorry. Is what, is what related to caffeine? The question is, is the protective effect of the liver related to caffeine, and as far as we know, that is in fact correct, yes. Question back to the back. What's the relationship between the receptor and the G protein? Okay, so it's just simply an interaction. That's, it is a physical interaction, that's correct. So the question was, what's the relationship between the receptor and the G protein? Is it a physical interaction? The answer is yes, it is a physical interaction. And so we see, again, some very big things happening as a result of small changes in protein structure. That's happening in this case in the binding of a, of a, um, um, a first messenger. Laurie? Is the G protein always there? Is the G protein always there? In fact, yes. Your cells are loaded with G proteins. Very abundant proteins in cells. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Kind of cool. All right. Other questions on that? Now, that's a big picture. One of the things you're going to see when we start talking, when we talk about these signaling pathways, is a lot of them you're going to see is this turns on this, turns on this, turns on this. And that's just the way that they go. It's important to understand what those steps are. I'll tell you that. But it's also important to see that big picture. And that big picture here is you now see how the body is releasing glucose when it needs to. There's a related hormone called glucagon. Okay? Glucagon acts in a way very, very similar to, to epinephrine. It's not released when you are afraid of something. Instead, it's released when glucose levels just start dropping. And one difference is that glucagon doesn't bind to the muscle cells. It binds only to liver cells. I like to think of glucagon as saying, glucose all gone. Right? Because what it's doing is it's stimulating the liver cell to give glucose and feed the body. Why doesn't it bind to muscle cells? The answer is because it, muscle cells can't make glucose. They only use that which they have. 
They can't give it to the rest of the body. Yes, sir. So, um, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, huh? This, does, is, is that like a breakdown somewhere in this process? Okay, so his question is hypoglycemia, is it a breakdown in the process? Hypoglycemia, from what I'm telling you, is going to happen as a natural phenomenon, okay? That is, you're going to see blood glucose levels are going to go up and down. Your body's going to modulate those blood glucose levels. What we think of as severe hypoglycemia, where we get very low and then we have problems associated with that, is that a breakdown in this process? I would argue to you that one of the ways that hypoglycemia happens is as a result of production of too much insulin. So when we think of diabetics that have issues with managing their insulin and they have to have, for example, sugar with them if they get very, very weak and their blood levels go very low, the reason is they've made too much insulin and as a consequence have taken too much glucose out of the bloodstream and it's fallen. Okay, we'll talk, I'll talk more about that later, but that's, that's one way of explaining hypoglycemia. There's others. Starvation, obviously, is another. Okay? Good questions. Okay. Let's see. G proteins. The G protein, uh, that's the alpha subunit over here. You can see the alpha subunit um, is the place where the GDP is held. And when the G protein has cleaved GTP, it still holds on to that GDP, so it doesn't let go of it. It's still got it there. There's the interaction between the alpha subunit and the beta and the gamma subunits, and it's nicely color-coded, as you saw in that last uh, slide. And there's a close-up, up close and personal about that. Again, uh, in fact, I think on the previous slide, it actually showed it binding down here. That's not really relevant in terms of just a cartoon is all it is. But the most important thing about the interaction between the alpha and the beta is that the al that interaction is the same site on the alpha where the adenylate cyclase would bind to it. So when the beta and the gamma is bound to it, it can't interact with the adenylate cyclase. Yes? Does the gamma ever interact with the alpha? No. Okay, adenylate cyclase. There is adenylate cyclase. It is a Membrane protein, my question to you is, is it a 7TM? Well, you can count, it's not, okay? So, but it is a membrane protein, so not all membrane proteins are 7TMs. Its catalytic activity is on the inside of the cell, and this is the pore, this is just a schematic representation of the uh, place inside the cell where uh, the, the catalysis actually occurs. In words, this is what's happening during um, activation of epinephrine, the epinephrine cycle. The um, 7TM for epinephrine has a specific name. It's called the beta adrenergic receptor. You should know that. Okay? So the beta adrenergic receptor is what epinephrine is binding to. The beta adrenergic receptor is a 7TM. Remember, the 7TM is a category of proteins. And now this is just in words telling you what I've already shown you on a schematic and also told you in other words. Now, there's one other thing we have to think about with turning off that signal. You probably haven't thought about it. So far, I've turned off the signal in terms of the G protein turning itself off by cleaving GTP. And I talked about how cyclic AMP, in fact, um, gets cleaved by phosphodiesterase if you're not drinking too much coffee. Okay? But there's another uh, thing that has to happen. This is not the one. I'm, I'm saying it without showing you the right figure. Okay? The other thing that has to happen is shown here. Let's imagine, for example, that I am a 7TM, and I've got a, an epinephrine sitting inside of me. Normally, this is not a covalent binding. What happens is that 7TM, the, the adrenergic receptor, can let go of that epinephrine, and it, it goes floating away, and everything is fine. That's what you see shown on the left. What happens, however, if that epinephrine gets stuck in the receptor? What's going to be the effect on the cell? Well, that receptor is going to keep signaling. It's going to keep activating a G protein. That G protein is going to cause everything else to happen, and we're going to keep breaking down our glycogen. We haven't turned the signal off. We can't turn the signal off. So cells have a backup way of turning off that signal when a receptor basically gets stuck in the on mode. Okay A way of dealing with that receptor if it gets stuck in the on mode. And that is shown here. Okay? The cell can recognize when a receptor has a stuck epinephrine by action of, an, uh, of what's called a receptor kinase. Okay? 
the receptor kinase will put phosphates onto that receptor, basically flagging it as having a problem. Okay? It's better to turn off the receptor than to kill the cell. The receptor gets phosphates, and the phosphates become targets for binding a protein called beta-arrestin. Beta-arrestin covers this guy up and keeps it from signaling. It's basically taken out of the signaling loop. So either way, by letting go of the hormone or by deadening the receptor, the cell is able to shut off the other end of the signal. Make sense? Clear as mud? Yes. Um, how does the cell know when that ha has to happen? I can't give you an answer to that. Okay? You can imagine that over time, okay, the longer this guy is active, the more uh, available it's going to be to the receptor to, to do this. That's one answer to your question. The other is you can imagine that if this is stuck, it may have a slightly different structure than one that's not stuck. And so that would also provide a template for that. Kabeen? How does it get stuck? How do you get stuck? Well, let's imagine that, how would you get something stuck? Well, uh, let's say you're trying to push something into something and you push it in a little further than you should and all of a sudden it doesn't come out. We can imagine that based on how this guy comes in here, it might in fact come in in some undesirable way and actually get stuck. So it's actually a physical phenomenon by which that can occur. Okay? I'm copying that as an answer to your question, but that's, that's a simple answer to it. Yes, sir? Is there a way to unstuck it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we make a bunch of mechanics here, aren't we? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. As long as we haven't as long as it hasn't covalently bound, which is what most of these interactions, most of these interactions are hydrogen bonds. So as long as it's not covalently bound, yes, it could ultimately be spit out by that, that receptor. So and it's not going to be something else that comes along and does it. It's just going to take time. And during that time, this guy is just going to be sitting here on it. Yeah. Her question is, beta arrestin come off when it gets unstuck. What do you guys think? Probably not. Those phosphates are the targets. And so unless you take those phosphates off, it's probably not going to happen. And as far as I know, those phosphates are stuck there. So what you've probably done is you just said, we're not going to take any more signaling through this guy. Keep in mind that you have probably 10,000 of these on your cell surface. Loss of one of them isn't going to do much to you. Yes, Lainey? Yeah, are there disorders where people don't make the beta resin? I honestly don't know. I would imagine that you might see that to some extent, but probably I would imagine that would be kind of self-selecting too, so I, I don't know, to be honest. Yes? Is it targeted for what? Is that, is that receptor targeted for degradation? In fact, non-functional proteins will frequently be targeted for degradation inside of cells, and I, we don't get to talk about that much in this class. There's a structure called a proteasome that is involved in... Uh, breaking down proteins that have lost function or are not functional uh, for, for whatever reason the cell wants to get rid of them. Um, so that probably would be where that would be targeted, but uh, again, um, I can't tell you definitively. Well, I had a song, but I guess we won't do a song. Maybe we'll do it at the beginning of next time, okay? So, all right. Take care, guys. Yes, is uh, beta resting on the outside or, in, or the inside? Inside. It's on oh, the inside. inside. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Why does it just leave and not go like, into the next one? Why does it what? Why does it just leave and not go into the next receptor? Like Not going to the next receptor? I'm not sure I understand. Like, when it disassociates, why does it not, like, how does it oh, okay. turn so, it off? Well, like, okay, yeah. I haven't told you, but epinephrine itself is actually also fairly easily broken down. As you would imagine, it would need to be. Otherwise, you're yeah, going to cause some problems. Okay, yeah. Hey, Sarah. Was that you back in the back? Yeah, it was. I, thought, I, I couldn't tell who that was. <laughs> I eat my lunch, so I sit in the back. So yeah, I what's up? Um, I was just wondering, so when you're talking about transmembrane receptors, uh -huh. as the, mo the signaling molecule is going you know, in and out,